Welcome to this first ever introduction to WAN optimization session. My name is John Pittle. I uh, work for Riverbed, service as CTO. And the intent of this session is to give you some background on WAN optimization um, as a technology and then focus in on using Wireshark to assess the effectiveness of your WAN op features and deployment. So having said that, um, we had some excite. I had some excitement about two hours ago when I discovered that uh, some of my uh, packet material that I had planned to use for this course um, is not going to be usable for this course. So um, what my plan is, I'm going to pivot. It's time to paint some birds here, uh, in the in the words of the great Bob Ross. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit. I the the first 10 to 15 minutes, um, maybe 20 minutes of the session is um, some background information about the technology, what it does, how it works. Um, I'm not going to I. I am able to get into uh, some of the captures, but I was planning to do a performance comparison and the the captures for the um, uh, optimized connections are not working the way that I had expected them to. So um, I will be doing some comparison um, from baseline workloads to optimized using my uh, a video capture that was done. Um, but in fairness to everyone, I want you to know that I'm, I'm not going to be able to do what I had planned to do for the last, uh, probably the last 20 minutes of the session. So I apologize. Um, and we're going to continue on to the material. Um, and your your decision is if you want some of the background information on this as a technology, please hang out with me. Um, if you decide that, uh oh, it's going to be incomplete, I'd rather do the other session. I totally understand. It's up to you. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. A little bit about me. I've been um, practicing performance engineering since 1980, very involved with network protocol analysis since the early 90s. I've been with OpNet Riverbed um, coming up on 15 years now. And I do love the mystery of very complicated performance issues. Um, been involved with SharkFest since 2017 and I shaved that beard off in 2003. So what was I thinking when I um, offered to do this session uh, to Sherry? My thought was is that you know the WAN op technologies in general really do modify protocol behavior, and when you're using Wireshark to look at um, captures that have been optimized, they can be very confusing. So the more background information you have about WAN op as a technology, the more effective you'll be interpreting Wireshark because you'll know what to expect or you'll get an, a sense of what are the possible things you can expect. Um, and then you can use Wireshark to determine the benefits of your, of your WAN op deployment. So that's the reason why I was thinking about this session. I'm not a WAN op salesperson. I'm not a WAN op specialist. I'm more uh, into visibility solutions and um, visibility engineering, but I did do a troubleshooting engagement for a customer last year that involved uh, WAN optimization and it was actually quite enlightening for me. Very, very interesting technology. So that's what that's what was my, my motivation. So in terms of an agenda, we're going to start out talking about why would you need WAN optimization. We'll then cover an overview of the features. We'll look at some very simple sample sample simple deployment patterns. And then we've got a little bit to show with Wireshark, but not as much as I was hoping. And then at the end of this deck, when it gets published to the retrospective site, um, you'll be able to use the appendix 
there's some reference material with more detail about um, the features, typical features of WAN optimization. So I've got a couple of disclaimers here because um, I want to be very clear uh, again that th this is a technology overview, it's not a sales pitch. So my goal is to help you use Wireshark to validate and tune your WAN op deployment. Or if you ever get involved in troubleshooting where there's WAN op, you'll, you'll, this information will be helpful. Um, we would have examined several Wireshark features for this purpose. Um, again, there's a small segment on general WAN op features and, and an overview so you'll know what to see in the uh, in, in in when when looking at capture. So full disclosure, the uh, samples, my some of my overview material and the sample captures um, come from my experience with with Riverbed because that's where I work. There are in fact other vendors in the marketplace. There's Cisco. There's Silver Peak. Um, certainly others. Um, all of them have a mix of the features that I will cover. I'm not an expert in those other products, so I don't know which ones they do uh, match. And maybe they have some features that are different than the ones we're gonna talk about. I, th I think it's high level enough and general enough that it, that it will apply pretty much to the marketplace. And the reason I'm using the Riverbed product is because I have easy access to that and to the materials that I needed for the, for the course. So my commitment to you, this is not a sales pitch. I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm here to inform. And uh, we'll be able to do a lot of what I was hoping to do. But again, because the captures uh, have some issues, I won't be able to do quite everything. So let's go ahead and get started. Why WANOP? Why, why would we need to even be thinking about or looking at WAN optimization? So there's two, two main drivers. Um, one is when we can overcome network performance issues, we do in fact improve user productivity. And most of the time um, businesses think of that in terms of dollars and cents. Um, when users can get more work done, that's a really good thing. And also reducing WAN bandwidth. Um, that was one of the early drivers for WAN optimization, but honestly, bandwidth has become so cheap in most major countries that it's not really a price issue anymore. What we're really dealing with is the time it takes to do upgrades. And of course, in some parts of the world, it is still expensive to get that last mile of, uh, of network connectivity. And then something new in the cloud era is uh, a new benefit of optimization is being able to reduce your cloud egress costs because you'll actually be downloading less payload from the cloud or certainly you won't be downloading payload that you've previous downloaded, previously downloaded. So some concepts and terminology to baseline and level set um, I don't think anything on this slide is going to be too surprising to the folks on the call, um, but I am going to be very picky about some terminology and terminology, terminology usage and comparing contrasting a couple of terms. So when, the, when an application is flowing across the network, um, the performance that it gets is primarily dependent on the health of the network end to end, your circuit health, um, port health, transceivers, device health, um, the amount of bandwidth that you have available. And, and that amount of bandwidth is not your biggest link, but it's the smallest link. So whatever your smallest link is in the path, that's the maximum bandwidth you're gonna be able to uh, utilize end to end. And whether that bandwidth is physical or if it's, um, uh, subscribed or provisioned uh, to be rate limited. You could have a one gig link, but paying your ISP for 100 meg, and, and therefore they provisioned a rate limiting feature of their facility so that you only get 100 meg. Even though you have a one gig cable uh, connecting to your premise. Um, latency is another huge part of performance and 
this is where I'm going to get really specific in a minute about the terminology. And when I'm talking about latency, I'm, I'm referring to the geographical distance and the speed of light propagation delay uh, across, that dis across that distance. And then the last component is congestion. And that could be devices that are busy, links that are congested. And it can even be QoS policies that um, need to be reviewed or updated or they were configured incorrectly. So rate limiting policies, um, uh, discard strategies when there's too much traffic in a class. Those are all elements of congestion. Uh, they're certainly not a physical issue, but more of a configuration and software uh, effect. So these are the performance issues that we have to be thinking about. And when we talk about latency, and this is where I want to get really specific on, on how I use this term and how I'd like you guys to think of it during this session. Latency is, uh, has a direct relationship with physics and distance. So in this context, we're talking about if you remove all other forms of delay and you're left with just how long does it take to propagate a signal um, from point A to point B, there's a time factor involved in that. So in the top, you can see New York to San Francisco, 2,500 miles, um, San Jose to San Francisco, 48 miles. So we know that the latency is going to be a lot less in the 48 miles. And with latency, that takes us into a discussion of something called round trip time. And Wireshark has a great uh, TCP measured value called round trip time to ACK. Um, I usually put it up as a column called RTT number two ACK, round trip time to ACK. But round trip time, um, again, a function of latency is the time required to send payload between two hosts. So like sending a request from A to B followed by a response from B back to A. So that entire time to get from A to B and then back B to A. The interesting thing about round trip time is more bandwidth is not going to improve round trip time when you're bound by latency. So you cannot fix a latency issue the way we're defining latency here as propagation delay. You cannot fix latency, you cannot improve latency with more bandwidth. I mean, there might be a smidgen reduction if you were to go from 10 meg to a gig, but you still have to deal with the fact that you've got to traverse the distance. Um, and it's kind of like if you were gonna drive from New York to San Francisco, it wouldn't matter if you were driving on a two-lane highway or a five-lane highway. Um, you still have to drive that distance between those two cities. And that, that drive takes time. So I want to introduce a key concept. We've talked about latency. We've talked about round trip time. Um, a key concept here is a concept of an application turn. And you don't always see this Ter terminology um, in, in every performance tool. Some tools talk about turns, some tools don't talk about terms. Wireshark, um, as far as I know, does not have a concept of counting turns and recognizing a turn. It certainly knows what round trip time is and it's certainly able to calculate server response time or, or the delta between a request being seen in the capture and the response for things like SMB, SIFS, um, HTTP, SQL. Um, but it's not a metric that is readily available. So let's define what is an application turn. So an application turn is a pair, a request message paired together with a response message. And I use the word message there instead of packets because a request message can actually be multiple packets and a response can be multiple packets. So if you think of an HTTP post um, message of 100K, 
that post message, it's one message, and it will uh, be made up of 10, 10 to 12 packets, 100, uh, 100K, maybe actually more, let's say 100 packets. Um, but that's, that's one application message being sent to the server, and the server will process it and send a response back to the sender. So request message up, response message back. The request response pair is equal to one turn. That represents a turn. And the time duration of what it takes to get the message up and back is at least one round trip time. It will never be less than one round trip time. And when you think about round trip times and turns, you, there's some pretty simple math that affects performance. And here's, here's a simple example. So if you had 10 turns between hosts and your round trip time was 100 milliseconds, you're looking at one second duration of delay that has nothing to do with bandwidth. It has nothing to do with server, respo server response time. It's totally uh, all about latency, round trip time, and the, and the turn rate. So we've got a couple of examples coming up. These are all very basic. I don't think, uh, I don't think too many people will have, uh, be too challenged with uh, the concepts here. So an HTTP example of a turn, here's an HTTP get message heading from the client to the server and the server responds with a 200 okay along with the response payload. That's one turn in the case of HTTP. Here's an SMB2 example where the client says, hey, I need to read 16K of data starting at file offset zero. That's the request message. Server gets that message, processes it, and said, okay, says, okay, here you go, response with a status, status okay, most likely. And then here comes the 16K in multiple packets, but here comes the response message and the associated payload, one turn. SQL, select star from customer table, go get a bunch of rows from a, from a database, and the response message would be some sort of database status along with the rows from the database, all on one message, boom, coming down to the client. Last one, FTP, the request message would be get file with a file name, maybe some transfer options like binary or ASCII. That, mess, that request message goes up to the FTP server, gets processed, a status message comes back along with the file download, one turn. One request up, one response back. Even though the response has could have 10 megs of, of packets, it's still one response. So let's look at then turn rate. So turn rate is just simply turns per second. And here we have a little animation with a user in San Rafael talking to New York, whatever uh, round trip time 80 milliseconds and whatever application he's using it's two turns to to get the data needed to render the screen so really low turn rate um, the user's pretty happy hey it feels like the network's pretty fast contrast that to a colleague over in san jose that might actually have a little bit less round trip time i purposely put that in the example, um, and a faster pipe. But because there's a lot more turns for this user, we have to go back and forth additional times, which means additional delay. And that user is not so happy. And even though he's got 100 meg, he's thinking, wow, this network is really slow. Why is it so slow? It's not because of bandwidth. It's not because of other factors. I mean, it could be, but you can't escape the fact that um, uh, the, the round trip time times the number of turns is a minimum amount of delay that you just cannot escape from. So we've talked about some applications moving messages back and forth and being affected by the latency and, and, and uh, round trip times. What about TCP? Is it sensitive to latency? Is a TCP stack on one machine 
going to behave or slow things down based on the latency between the two hosts? Does it have a concept of turns as well? Well, it's not exactly as explicit as here's a request, here's a response, but there are definitely mechanisms within TCP that are in fact affected by latency. So if you think about the congestion window me uh, mechanisms of slow start where we send one segment and then we have to wait for an ACK, how long are we gonna wait? We're gonna wait one round trip time. If that's 100 milliseconds, we're waiting 100 milliseconds and we've sent one segment on the network. If that's successful, we'll send, we'll double it, we'll send two segments. How long do we have to wait? one round trip time. Actually for that first one, it's a little bit longer because of delayed act, but the second little burst of two segments, um, they get sent over one direction, get received and the act comes in the opposite direction, round trip time, whatever that is, we're waiting. So now we send four segments, round trip time delay, eight segments, round trip time delay. So. TCP is affected by total latency. Um, think also about um, retransmissions waiting to determine if something has arrived. If, it has, if, if the round trip time is higher, is higher than the retransmit timeout, we're gonna retransmit unnecessarily, which is a stack tuning issue. The point is, is that you do pay a round trip time penalty for some of these. And the reason I call it a penalty is because we take a performance hit. And anytime where there's a performance hit, users generally say the network is slow. Ah, so, it, so latency and round trip times are important to, for us to understand. So there's something coming up on the next slide that for me personally, if you remember only one thing from this entire session, um, please remember this next slide. Latency times turn rate equals pain. First, the pain is the user pain. That's going to get translated into maybe their manager's pain, which is going to get translated into your manager's pain, which is going to get translated, you know where this is going, into your pain. So latency times turn rate equals pain. Um, low turn rate low pain, high turn rate, ouch, it hurts a lot. Um, and, and honestly, I've seen, I've seen um, SMB file shares, or I think it was called distributed file system. It was the mechanism where you're on your Windows machine, you think your files are local, but they're not, they're really at the file server. And I don't mean just your H drive, I mean like even your desktop. Um, the Windows admin had a policy, everybody's stuff is on the server, nothing is kept local other than temporary trash files. Six milliseconds, a, data, a, a company moved um, from their home da data center at headquarters, literally six milliseconds round trip away. And most everything was fine. We did a data center migration assessment of a bunch of applications, most everything was handled really well. The mainframe, no issues. HTTP, pretty much no issues. But man, uh, Windows desktops, it was horrible. Absolutely horrible. People were immediately complaining about why is Windows so slow? What they, what they, what they saw and they felt was, wow, Windows is slow. Um, I click on the start button or I hover over the start button and Windows freezes, like that's weird. And that all had to do with behind the scenes, um, a lot of SMB, very chatty uh, transactions, even with a six millisecond turn rate, there was pain. So if you can reduce the turn rate, you will reduce the pain. If you can reduce latency, and I don't mean like physically reduce it, but fake it out somehow. If you can use some proxying capabilities to make sure I don't have to go all the way back to the other side, maybe the data is locally available to me, or maybe there's some strategies where I can make that data available local. 
and I don't have to go all the way to the other side. So if you can reduce the turn rate, you're gonna reduce pain. If you can reduce latency, you're gonna reduce pain. So quick review on this section, the issues affecting performance, not having enough bandwidth, general network health, protocol chattiness, we've been talking a lot about that, and application layer inefficiencies. For example, database calls, you could have a select statement and the way you formulated your select statement, you said, I want to I want to fetch one row at a time. I don't want all of the contents. I want to fetch one row at a time. That's a feature of SQL called cursor fetching. And if you start having to, to ask for each row of a 1 million row table, you now have a major performance issue because each, each request for a row is a turn. And latency is the secret killer. Um, latency plus round trip time equals pain. And we don't want pain. We don't want you to have pain. So, so the WAN optimization technologies were really event in, invented and designed to address uh, these issues. So um, features overview. We're going to talk now a little bit about features of WAN optimization, but we're going to start with just a sim just laying out a topology, explaining where what what's involved, where things fit. Um, and again, I'm using a riverbed context because that's what I have access to. Um, there's other vendors; they probably do it very similarly. Just be aware of that. So um, we've got this notion of the steelheads. They notice that they're physically in path. That and let's see if I do my uh, laser pointer here. That there's a land zero side and a WAN zero side for this client steelhead, and there's same thing on the server side, a land zero and WAN zero. And the LAN zero interface is like a proxy for the server. So the client believes he's talking, well, the when the client is talking to the server, this device says, hmm, I wonder if I can help speed this up any. And if he can, he will. Like maybe sending an ACK immediately. So if this client is uploading data, we can speed that up <clears throat> by sending ACKs back immediately pretending to be the server. Okay, I'm ready for more data. Okay, I'm ready for more data. And at that point, the client is actually um, treating or behaving in such a way as if the server were local because the acts are coming back quickly. So um, the client still had LAN zero interfaces like a proxy for representing the server. And same thing on this end, the LAN zero interface on the server side is acting like a proxy representing all the clients. So again, if the server is sending data down, payload down to clients, um, if there's a if the client is at a site that has another steelhead, then there's a potential for this uh, device to immediately act just so that we'll get more payload and we'll get it faster, um, so that we're it's not really eliminating turn or round trip time, but it's speeding it up. And then we have um, WAN zero on one device is always in communications with WAN zero on the other device doing some optimization controls as well as data transfer. So this device could literally queue up, queue up, queue up, while it, while the while we're telling the server keep it coming keep it coming keep it coming, and then have a an optimized high speed uh, strategy to get the data across the network to the other side, where as soon as it's over here now this device can start to feed it <clears throat> feed it back to uh, to the client, and and. Um, as those acts come in, chances are a lot of the data is already here because we're pushing it faster than it would otherwise get there. And we can, we can send it 
um, we can respond to those acts with more payload faster. So again, helping to deal with round trip time. So given that topology, the in-path um, physical deployment, the uh, LAN zero, WAN zero on each device, again, this is highly simplified. There are dozens of options available to map to any particular design for a branch or a data center. Um, but we'll start with simple and keep it there for a bit. So in terms of optimization features of this, of, of WANOP technology, I'm gonna start with talking about transport optimization um, or TCP layer four optimization. So first and foremost, and I mentioned this already, the proxying and some ax spoofing. So if the, um, if the client side steel, if the client is uploading client side steelhead um, acting on behalf of the server can act payload quickly, then the client will say, great, let me keep it going. Let me keep it coming. And the appliances have lots of extra memory and extra storage space. They're designed to buffer up lots of space at the same time, asynchronously sending it across the wire to the other end, all in attempts to reduce the effects of latency and round trip time. Then there's intelligent caching. And I think, you know, different vendors have different strategies. One of the um, interesting ones that I see is byte pattern matching as well as object caching, but also byte pattern matching. So if you're actually um, working on a file uh, on Office 365 uh, or OneDrive, and um, you make a copy of that file, change the file name, you've created another object, but essentially all the byte patterns have not changed significantly. So the byte patterns for that quote unquote new file already exist in the cache. So very intelligent caching, compression and deduplication, um, connection pooling between those two WAN interfaces, the WAN zero interfaces, there's multiple connections that are at the ready. We don't have to do a three-way handshake across the WAN. The connections are already set up, they're already alive, and they can then be allocated just like any connection pool, whether we're talking about a database connection pool or even for load balancers, a load balancer connection pool. And then this one is pretty interesting as well. Um, let's say the client opens up a connection. So overrides for suboptimal TCP options. Let's say the, um, uh, the client opens a connection with a, with, without window scaling. So without window scaling and with, and I'll just make up a number, a 32K receive window. That's its maximum. Well, as that SIN packet goes through the in-path device, the device can change that to say, okay, let's, let's have this SIN packet actually do window scaling. That's a good thing, especially with high latency. And let's have it increase um, the total receive window size to, if you've heard of bandwidth delay product, to a bandwidth delay product value that's appropriate for that, um, uh, measured link speed and measured latency. So the devices can override those suboptimal options, um, receive window as one, turning SAC on and off as another. Um, I think those are pretty good examples. Another really interesting feature is having enhanced packet loss recovery mechanisms on the WAN side between the two uh, WAN op devices. So the notion that um, maybe my endpoint hosts, my client, my server, maybe their TCP stacks have really not been tuned or maybe they haven't been patched or maybe they haven't been updated recently or they've been modified in such a way that it's really not appropriate for a particular WAN scenario. Um, well, the, um, uh, the WAN op devices, when they experience packet loss in the 
in the WAN portion end to end, they're able to uh, adapt, adopt, and apply um, enhanced packet loss recovery mechanisms. You know, really specialized, really uh, optimized, whereas the host devices don't have to be involved in that. Whereas without the optimization appliances in the middle, then the end host devices would have to deal with that uh, error recovery. And then the last one I'm mentioning here is high latency detection and then enabling and adapting some techniques for that high latency. So for example, um, satellite links. So rather than having the end hosts have to adopt and apply some special TCP features around very high latency links, the, um, the WAN up devices are able to do that in the path without making any changes to the endpoint hosts. So that was transport optimization. How about application protocol, protocol specific? optimization. So these would be special optimizations for HTTP, for SMB. Um, Lotus Notes, I'm not sure that's so relevant anymore these days. Um, and I know I'm forgetting one. Uh, HTTP, SMB, it may come to me later. So the good news here is that um, just like with TCP, we can override suboptimal settings and behavior. For example, let's say there's an SMB read request for 16K. Well, the appliances can get that request to go, wait a minute, we could, we could, we could run a lot faster if we actually ask for more. Now, it'd be great to know what, what the server can support and it'll figure that out based on the traffic. But at a minimum, change that 16K read request to a 64K read request and then pass it through to the other side. The server gets it, sends back the 64K um, you know, in, in, in regular segment size packets. And then on the client side, the device hands off the payload in 16K chunks to make sure that the client is happy. So there's a way to, um, override suboptimal settings. Same thing with um, HTTP. So this concept of prefetch, if, if we see a uh, HTML request come through, goes all the way through the network to the web server, the server side device analyzes the response and it realizes that, hmm, this web page needs um, the CSS files, these JPEGs, these other objects that are on that server. So that creates an opportunity for the server side device to then prefetch those objects. Prefetch those objects in advance before the client asks for them. And then those objects go across the WAN, they hit the client side device, and they're sitting there in a cache waiting for the client to ask for them. And you can interrogate the, um, the, the, the caching characteristics of objects to determine, oh, this is probably gonna be in the client's um, temporary cache or maybe it won't be, or maybe it's expired or it's going to expire on a certain date. So there's some, there's some intelligence around the prefetching, but the intent is, is let's move as much relevant data as possible closer to the client before the client asks for it. And that way, when he does ask for it, it's already local to the client. So local speed. And in a way, if you think about it, that's another example of anticipating data needs and then reducing round trip times because now the client doesn't, when the client asks for it, it's already local. Same thing with read ahead. That would be where if the, um, if the devices figure out that, hmm, it looks like this is a sequential file read because we keep reading and we increment the offset, it looks like we're really just reading this file. Let's go ahead and read ahead further into the file and stage it back at the client so that it's actually local. So that's another example of making data local and eliminating round trip times. Um, and then object caching is to keep things hanging around. Um, certainly from an HTTP perspective, um, 
any cacheable objects could be could be uh, stored in the appliance locally where where the um, where the client is, so that when the client asks for it, it's a local it's a local transfer. We don't have to go across the WAN to get it because it's already there. So in addition to those protocol specific optimizations, there's also traffic shaping is a typical feature that you would see where uh, based on some criteria and some policy, we're gonna protect certain bandwidth, or I'm sorry, we're gonna protect bandwidth on the wide area network based on priority of traffic. And then what's really interesting is to be able, this next item here, to be able to recognize the application based on signatures within uh, the payload. Certainly you can recognize SIP traffic, that's pretty easy. But what about telling the difference between going to work day where people need to get to in order to um, you know, perform HR duties versus going to Facebook wall? And if you can tell the difference between those two by in interrogating the traffic, not by the IP address, because the IP addresses are always changing, but by looking at other patterns and signatures and then recognizing the app, um, mapping it to a name and then mapping that name to a, pol to a policy, which then drives your traffic management policies. Very, very powerful to protect the bandwidth that you do have. And then finally, the traffic between the appliances on the WAN is, uh, is encrypted automatically. So these are features around um, transport, application in the appendix when this deck gets posted when this deck gets posted up to uh, uh, to the retrospective site in the appendix you will see um, uh, additional details about about these features so hopefully you've noticed some common themes around um, of all these features. They're all designed to do these things, reduce turns, reduce payload, um, help eliminate having to do the round trip across the WAN. And then of course, all of that is very helpful to reduce pain. And this is, I think all of us are very interested in reducing pain. Um, a couple of very quick admin and ops features, policy-based configuration. Yes, there's typically CLI commands, but there's also policy-based uh, GUI to, to push configurations out to a large uh, number of appliances. Syslog sysdump, you would expect, and TCP dump, there was just, I couldn't pick an icon, so I just picked a bunch of icons because we love TCP dump, right? Without TCP dump, we can't use Wireshark. So being able to control and, and obtain captures from remote sites uh, on the LAN interface or the WAN interface or both, and then having those, those captures um, come to where you are so that you can then do the analysis, that's, that's pretty huge in terms of um, operating and managing the network and dealing with troubles, remote troubleshooting. And most appliances generate NetFlow, which is really useful to help you see who's using the links, how much bandwidth, what, what ports, et cetera. So before we leave this section, I just wanna call out um, something that I've heard a lot in the marketplace around SD-WAN versus WAN-OP. There's a lot of marketplace material that says you don't actually need WAN-OP when you transition over to SD-WAN. To which I would ask the question, well, what does SD-WAN actually do to address the pain of high latency and high turn rate? Because when I have worked with SD-WAN, it's usually been around uh, developing policies around uh, policy-based routing, quality of service, path selection based on, on uh, application determination. But the raw, the raw vanilla or plain vanilla SD-WAN really does not address um, how we eliminate uh, and how we deal with round, uh, high turn rates and, and high round trip times. But there is something in when, if, if you're looking at SD-WAN or hearing about it, there's, 
two kind of bizarre terms. One is network feature virtualization. It's not bizarre in itself, but then there's another term called VNF. So there's NFEs and VNFs. And I just will, will quickly comment on that. And the idea with these network uh, feature, uh, virtual functions is to take several feet network features that used to be in their own box, like a firewall, a WAN op, uh, a router, and put them all into one hardware platform at the edge of the network, and then create a service chain of these virtual functions, create a service chain um, really in a path so that in one physical appliance, you've got really multiple virtual capabilities. Those could include routing, could include encryption, IPS, IDS, firewall. And of course, you could have uh, a virtual WAN optimization device in that service chain so that you have the opportunity to optimize the traffic before you actually encrypt it and then you actually route it across the network. So really a very quick comment on SD-WAN. Um, so a couple of deployment examples. Uh, the, this is very minor compared to all that there could be. So we already talked about um, physical in path with a LAN side and a WAN side. I want to move on to something that's becoming more and more interesting and applicable, which is running a steelhead on my laptop or my desktop. I mean, I think most people are using laptops and MacBooks these days. But the answer is, yeah, you can actually run steelhead software on your laptop and get many of all the features that we've talked about. There's some that you won't have, but all the important ones, the transport optimization, the uh, HTTP, SMB, um, SSL, those are all uh, baked in to a software version that you run on your laptop. And you still have the concept of two appliances that are talking to each other. So in the case of it, it says data center here, this could be a cloud, uh, uh, a cloud pop. Um, your device on the server side and your device on the client side, which is actually inside the client. And from where does it, where does this software image, the software optimization fit in your, in your stack? So I'm taking a little bit of a risk. Um, I'm pretty sure it's at, at the data link layer before we go out to the physical NIC. I think that's a safe bet. But like on my laptop, there's a, a software version, there's a LAN zero interface, there's a WAN zero interface, and it behaves pretty much just like the hardware appliance, doing the things that the hardware appliance does. What about dealing with SaaS applications? So here's an example where you've got your uh, software version running in your laptop, you can as all of us are doing work from anywhere. And there's some special policies that say, well, we're gonna actually peer, we're gonna create a peering relationship with a, a, a software appliance that's actually in Azure. And once we establish that peering connection, that, that inner channel that I was talking about um, earlier, um, now, when we want to talk with Office 365 or some other uh, SaaS applications, we're literally able to get the benefits of um, reduced turns, reduced latency, um, client-side caching, server-side caching um, for SaaS applications. And this is pretty huge. I was really hoping, I was doing my testing, performance testing for this course, which I'll be talking some more about um, earlier this week, did it did an initial baseline at home, then I had to a doctor's appointment, I, I took my laptop, I thought, how cool would it be if I was in my doctor's office, and able to show that I've got the same caching capability. In fact, my warm cache from my testing in the morning, it is still warm, even though I'm in the doctor's office. Um, and it would have been great, except for they didn't have a guest wireless. <laughs> they had a private wireless, but not a guest wireless, unfortunately. But it, it 
literally would have worked. I would have had a warm cache of things that I've been doing that have been um, local on my laptop, even though I was in a new location. So work, work from anywhere, being able to do SaaS applications, very applicable to today's environment. So um, we're going to talk now about um, measuring the effectiveness. Let's say you have WAN up in your environment and you're asked to get a capture, look at it with Wireshark. What are some of the things you can do to measure the effectiveness uh, of, of the deployment? So there's kind of two dimensions I want to talk about. One is bandwidth reduction. Um, that one's actually quite easy. The other one is Im improving user productivity or, or reducing response time. That one does take a little bit more brain power. We got to plug our brains in. We got to be thinking about which features are in use or should be in use and what should they be doing and how would it look when I'm looking at the traffic, how would a capture look if I'm looking at the traffic in, in Wireshark? And then there's a third one um, around in terms of my deployment. Am I actually, you have I turned on the flow recording capability? Am I forwarding out flow to uh, my flow tool? And am I actively using packets when I need them? Do people even know that, yeah, I can grab packets from Singapore while I'm in Orlando, I just talk to log into the uh, appliance, start up a TCP dump, generate the traffic, and then save the capture off. So a couple of easy things, and then one not quite so easy. So let's first look at the easy one. And I realize this is going a little slower than I had planned. Um, the easy one around, are we reducing bandwidth? And what I have on the screen is a view from my laptop where it's tracking different connections from different processes on my laptop, OneDrive, Outlook, um, Slack, et cetera. And uh, I'm gonna zoom into this little window here, which has been tracking one TCP connection ever since it was opened for OneDrive, and OneDrive usually does have multiple connections. You know, they're, they're short-lived, so you do some work, you close it down, you keep one up for control, you might start a new one. Um, this one was me doing my testing with a, um, a large PowerPoint file, and you can see on the LAN data side, we logged 57 meg of traffic on the LAN associated with OneDrive, and due to caching and other strategies of optimization, I only had to put less than a meg across the wide area network. And here you can see my, my peer that I'm talking to in Azure, this 52141 address, that's actually the server side steelhead that's close to my um, Office 365 uh, instance. So again, pretty easy to get information about, uh, um, uh, about bandwidth reduction. But when it comes to reducing response time, now we're into having to do some timing comparisons. And when we do those timing comparisons, it ideally is going to be with some known workload where we can see, okay, are we having the effect that we wanted to have in terms of timing? And, and, and how long does it take to perform a particular unit of work? So there's three comparisons that are typically relevant. The first one is no optimization at all, just a plain old vanilla network, two hosts doing a, a structured bit of, of uh, activity, taking the, taking the captures, doing the measurements, and then are using Wireshark rather to do the measurements, and then enabling optimization, doing that same workload again, at that moment, it's a cold cache. So it's going to not be too crazy exciting other than there would be some transport optimization around uh, TCP axe spoofing. And then once the cache is populated, we should see some exciting response times with, with, a, warm, with a warm cache. 
So this kind of takes me into um, analysis and timing. Again, I'm, I, when I started the session at the beginning, I commented um, that uh, very unfortunately, I, about two hours ago, I discovered the captures that I had created for Lan and Wan. Um, there's something wrong with them. I, I can't say it any other way. They're, they're, not, uh, they're not healthy captures. <laughs> And I'm looking at, I'm going, wait a minute, this can't be right. Um, and looked at it some more. Um, so I, I can't do everything I was planning to do, but I can do some. So um, we've got about four minutes. I'm just gonna very quickly step through this and then, and then we'll pause for Q&A. So my scenario for testing as I was thinking about how to demonstrate using Wireshark to evaluate your um, uh, your optimization deployment efficiency and success. So I created I created a workload. Um, there's a test script that I planned out in advance. I've got Steelhead Mobile on my laptop. I'm using OneDrive um, uh, in the cloud. I'm sure it's on the West Coast. And my test file is a 56 meg PowerPoint that on my uh, that I'm copying to my local OneDrive. And when I put anything in my local OneDrive via File Explorer, OneDrive is supposed to wake up and then upload it to the cloud. And then I also did it by dragging and dropping into a Firefox browser. So opening up my OneDrive uh, through the browser. Um, and then dragging. So that there were some tests around that. And then also editing my PowerPoint on my local OneDrive, basically adding some slides, duplicating some slides and saving it. And then when I save it, it's supposed, OneDrive is supposed to wake up and send it up to the cloud so that it's in sync. Same thing with using PowerPoint online. Not sure if you've done that. It's, it's, a, it's a definitely a new experience using PowerPoint online. But you can make changes that not quite the full range of PowerPoint features, but you can make some changes online. And then when it's saved, it's saved in the cloud. And then what happens, it gets downloaded to your laptop. So we're looking at uploading to the cloud and downloading to the cloud. And the intent was to capture packets for all steps. Something's wrong with those capture files, unfortunately. Here's my test script. I tried to be very methodical so that I know where I'm at when I'm looking at the captures. I've inserted pings in between the actual steps. It's probably a little bit too ambitious. I could have probably gotten away with three steps instead of this many or three operations. Um, and then the very first um, uh, baseline is with when I'm totally disabled. And we're only going to look at this and then we're going to pause for Q&A. So the scenario is I'm in my home office. There's no WAN op. Um, I'm using uh, 2.4 gig Wi-Fi. I'm capturing using uh, uh, WinPCAP off my Wi-Fi interface. These, this is my OneDrive. This is my SharePoint with uh, uh, PowerPoint, uh, online PowerPoint. Got a nice capture. They all look good. I can see that I've been, you know, again, this is the baseline, no WAN up. I can see how long, I can see when I started, how long things lasted from a connection standpoint and how much data got moved back and forth on each connection. Here's my OneDrive connections. Here's my SharePoint connections. This is one of the features I wanted to highlight in Wireshark. Some people use this IO graph extensively. Some people say, what's an IO graph? Um, some people are very comfortable with the um, filtering capabilities and the way to add metrics to the graph. Some people go, oh, man, I can't figure that out to save my life. I was one of those people, and then I got some help, and I'm a little bit more comfortable now um, using the chart. But one of the things you can see in terms of what's on this chart, three minutes to go, um, the line in black is any packets that came from my laptop. So payload, packs, but I'm using throughput here as my metric bits per second. So yeah, there's probably some acts in there, but what's important is the, uh, uh, is the payload packets of uploading to the cloud. This is where I was editing uh, online 
and then that ultimately got saved out in the cloud. And then once OneDrive on my laptop figured out that something's changed in the cloud, then it downloaded it to my laptop to keep them in sync. So 64.2 seconds to upload, 24.4 to download. This is me doing editing. Not sure it's really appropriate, uh, relevant for the test. Um, but this is, this is the baseline. And now what we want to do is find out, hey, with optimization turned on, um, is it faster? So this is where I had problems. And Bob Ross says, hey, when you make mistakes, uh, paint in birds. So that's what, that's what I did. The good news is in my baseline, I did, um, I did video. I did, screen, uh, sorry, I ran a video recording while I was doing all the baseline testing. I find for me that's very useful because I tend to forget and now I've got everything on the screen. I can play it back and look at it. Well, then what I did today, and this is kind of really interesting, today, 30 hours since I warmed up the cache, the cache is actually still warm on my laptop and in the cloud. And I did a test today um, that I captured on another little video. We're not gonna have time to play it, but what I found in terms of time comparisons is my upload with optimization turned on is 16 seconds. I did a couple of them that, that was kind of like the average. One might have been 14, one might have been 17. 16 seconds to upload versus 64 seconds, and then nine seconds to download versus 24 seconds. So this is an example of the timing. I, I wanted to have um, uh, a, a chart and I did have a chart, but when the more I looked at the chart, the chart just didn't look right. There's something, something's not right here with this chart. And that led me to look closely at the captures and then finding out, nope, it's time to, it's time to paint birds. Uh, something's wrong. But I was able to double check today, you know, again, 30 hours after initially warming the cache. And what's interesting is it's still up in the cloud because the cache is synchronized between the two endpoints. So it's an example. So we covered a lot of material. Um, I think if I had to do this class over again, I might split it up into two sessions. There is a lot of material, a lot of background. This is where we're going to pause for Q&A um, as my PowerPoint decides to not respond. This is great. So here we go. So Q&A time. Uh, Naomi, can you help me with Q and A? Sure. Okay. Um, so it looks like we just got two questions. All right. Um, in the Q and A, it's, let's see here. The first one is: Is SA or SAS a real threat to pure WAN op solutions? Oh gosh, um, is that Dave? Dave Cullen. Dave, I'm apologize. I'm not familiar personally with uh, SASE. Uh, sadly, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to Google that. Um, and I think, I don't know if we have your email. I'll ask Angela if we can answer directly back when we're, uh, how about the next one? And the next one is, is there a concern for data safety when cats on the WAN optimizer, PCI or HIPPA issues? Sure, sure. So, so the cache is uh, encrypted. Is my, is my understanding. I'm not, I'm not a steelhead expert, um, but my understanding is the cache is encrypted and the hardware has been through um, different FIPS uh, certifications, including if somebody yanks out a drive of a, of a RAID, um, is, is, that, is that usable in any way? And, and my understanding is, is that, that that it is FIPS certified, and I don't. Again, you know, apologies. I'm not a. I'm not a steelhead expert. Um, I, more on the visibility side, but my understanding from my colleagues and and working with some of our federal customers is that um, it has been through FIPS certification. So I think it is. Okay, that's it. So yeah, however you want to wrap it up. Go okay. for it. Well, well. Anyway, um, apologies, folks, for 
it just didn't work. I, I just didn't work. So when I say it didn't work, my, my captures were not healthy and I couldn't do the analysis that I was planning to do. Uh, when I do post the deck, however, there will be the appendix section in the back with more details about the various features. Um, I hope we do Wireshark next year. I hope I get a chance to do this again and, and, and deliver it the way I, I really would like to. But I I've also am hopeful that the background information we discussed was useful and thought provoking around literally how, um, the, how pain is caused by latency and um, turn rate. Those two things together is, is what kills performance. And this, this particular stack of technology, and again, this is multi-vendor um, in the marketplace, really does address as best it can um, those issues. And as you saw from, from these numbers here, uh, these numbers are real. And when you have people collaborating on large files and uh, you can speed up by minutes, you know, each of their work tasks and it's a repetitive process, it turns into real value for the business. So that's it. That's all. Thank you guys, everyone, for joining. Uh, wish you have a great weekend.